Ooh. Hi, hello. Hi, hello, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, wonderful to uh, transition into our third panel of the uh, Sino US Symposium at the 14th. Uh, the 14th annual symposium at Taos University. My name is Hai Tong. I am a senior at Taos. I'm a fourth year student and uh, I study international relations and uh, I'm the vice president of Surge or Sino-US Relations Group Engagement. Uh, once again, uh, today we have a fabulous cast of uh, three experts um, who will be joining us in a panel um, talking about the future of um, Sino-US uh, Sino security confrontation, and particularly with regards to the ongoing situation in Ukraine and the uh, new developments um, coming um, coming out from both sides of the Taiwan Strait. So um, the first one uh, is uh, our very own Professor Beckley uh, at the Political Science Department at Tufts University, who is a leading expert on the balance of power between the United States and China. Uh, Professor Beckley is also the author of two books and multiple award-winning articles, um, a associate professor of political science at Tufts University and a non-resident uh, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, the AEI. Previously, Professor Beckley was a international security fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and worked for the United States Department of Defense, the Rand Corporation, and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, he continues to advise offices within the US intelligence community and um, the United States Department of Defense. Once again, thank you very much for joining us, Professor Beckley. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks so much for, for having me. So I'll, I'll kick things off and just focus on the Taiwan issue and then maybe in um, Q&A or a discussion, we can talk about sort of the broader US-China relationship. But just given Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you know, obviously a potential Chinese assault on Taiwan is very much on people's minds. And I mean, my own sense is that, you know, an uh, invasion is is unlikely just because great power war is an unlikely event, but it's more likely than any of us should be really comfortable with in the same way that a Russian all-out invasion of Ukraine was maybe not super likely prior to the actual invasion, but it happened and shows that old fashioned conquest is still alive and well and something that needs to be taken seriously. And I'm, I'm especially concerned because I think if there is a Chinese assault on Taiwan, that it's probably gonna happen sooner rather than later. So i.e. In, in this decade, in the 2020s, rather than in the 2030s or 2040s. And I'm also very concerned because if war occurs, I actually think the war could could escalate significantly, could well become protracted because neither uh, neither Beijing nor Taipei or, or Washington will easily be able to capitulate. There aren't easy off ramps to a war once it's started. So I, I'll, I'll kind of flush those two main points out just in the next five to 10 minutes. Um, and, you know, well, I, I guess my first point is, well, we, we need to think long term about competition between the United States and China. I think on the Taiwan issue, we do need to be thinking short term because China's own history, like the history of Chinese use of force, as well as its recent behavior suggests that um, if there is going to be an assault on Taiwan, it could happen soon. So there's been a lot of studies that have analyzed when and why China uses force, and they all reach a pretty similar conclusion. They, they argue that China goes to war not when it's rising and everything is going great for it, but when its security situation is starting to deteriorate and its bargaining strength is starting to decline. So Tom Christensen, who's this famous uh, China scholar at, at Columbia says, he, he did a big study and he basically found that China uses force to either exploit a closing window of opportunity or to avoid an opening window of vulnerability. And my concern is that I think we face that situation right now, that China has a potentially closing window of opportunity in the Taiwan Strait, and at the same time, it has an opening window of vulnerability in its broader strategic situation. So I think it has a, a, a window of opportunity in the Taiwan Strait right now because, first of all, China is just coming off decades of rapid military modernization. China has been churning out warships at a faster rate than any country has since World War II. And so you had this major shift in the cross-strait military balance between China and Taiwan. But I think that advantage is going to peak this decade because um, the United States is also going to downsize temporarily its naval, its air and naval presence in East Asia because a lot of U.S. Uh, warships, guided missile submarines, long-range bombers, those were all built in the 1980s under Ronald Reagan. 
and they're at this point they're they're ke- they're literally catching on fire. They're they're not usable anymore, and so they're going to have to be retired on mass. And so in the late 2020s, you're going to have this temporary dip in U.S. Uh, firepower, essentially in East Asia, um, and as a result, that gives China even more of a potential opportunity. But on the other hand, I think that window of opportunity won't stay open for very long because both the United States and Taiwan have ambitious plans to rapidly develop their their strike options in East Asia to, to spread out their forces and make them much more resilient against a Chinese uh, preemptive um, attack. And so China has its chance, but probably not for very long. And at the same time, it faces this opening window of vulnerability at the grand strategic level. And that's for a few reasons. One is that um, China's economic growth is is starting to slow. So, you know, for most of the past 30 years, China, you know, its economy was growing like gangbusters. It was mostly self-sufficient in, in most resources. It had a huge demographic dividend with lots of workers and relatively few elderly um, people to take care of or, or, or children. And at the same time, it had probably the most secure geopolitical environment in modern Chinese history. Um, you, you didn't have you know, Japan preying on you or Western imperialist powers attacking you if you're China. And China also had pretty easy access to foreign markets and technology. And a lot of this, frankly, was underpinned by a solid relationship with the United States, which helped provide for um, a, a more secure environment. But I think all of those factors I just listed are starting to reverse that China is running out of resources, its economic growth is slowing, it's running out of working age people, it's starting to amass a huge population of senior citizens. Um, and, uh, you know, China just, these, these economic headwinds are, are hitting China at the same time that China is now confronting an increasingly hostile security environment. So just around the world, negative views of China have surged to levels we haven't seen since uh, the Tiananmen Square massacre. And they're starting to manifest themselves in ways that are making life more difficult for leaders in Beijing, whether it's the rise of a more independent Taiwanese identity, um, the fact that there's thousands of new trade and investment barriers that have been slapped on China over the last few years, uh, countries kind of balking at their Belt and Road projects. Um, there's, the, there's this series of sort of uh, export control, these sort of ad hoc coalitions of countries that are trying to cut China off from key technologies. So the key example there is the semiconductors coalition, where you had a bunch of rich countries try to cut China off from advanced chips. That kind of model is sort of being scaled out over lots of other different types of technologies. And even, you know, with, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you've also had sort of the reinvigoration of of the West, as it used to be known. And, you know, some of these countries, the major economies have kind of had some practice about what it would entail to cut a major power out of the global financial system. And so that has to be very concerning for China, just because you've already gotten these parties kind of together and talking and practicing, if it were, you know, on, on Russia and those kind of same weapons could be turned on to China. So I think that's the strategic backdrop that we need to look at the Taiwan situation today. Because if you're if you're Xi Jinping, who, who, by the way, is going to be you know pushing 80 years old by the 20 early 2030s? Then you're probably thinking, if you want to accomplish that long-standing national goal of reunification, it doesn't look like there's any peaceful option, just given where Taiwan is moving in terms of public opinion. And so you might need to turn to more coercive options. And the 2020s seem like if you're going to strike, would be the best time to do it. So none of this means that you know war is imminent in the Taiwan Strait, but it's certainly more likely than I'm frankly comfortable with. Um, and so this means that, you know, for the United States and Taiwan, they, they both of them really need to get their act together as soon as possible. There's all these debates, you know, going on in DC about, you know, should or should not the United States build a 355 ship Navy, like all, you know, or should we spend lots of money on R and D on weapon systems that are going to be ready 10 or 15 years from now. And for me, I just think those are sort of beside the point that the United States actually needs a surge of um, of weapon systems in the Taiwan Strait or around the Taiwan Strait as soon as possible to try to maintain some level of deterrence there. And for in Taiwan, you know, it's the same thing. Taiwan has developed new strategic concepts that would make themselves kind of like what the Ukrainians have done, making themselves a prickly porcupine that is just really hard to conquer. But the problem is uh, Taiwan hasn't put its defense dollars where its mouth is. So it's still spending money on fancy items like F-16s that may get blown up in the first few hours on the runway in a Chinese uh, preemptive missile strike or on indigenously built ships that you know may not make it out of port um, 
at the outset of a war rather than on what the Ukrainians have, which are like lots of little, you know, uh, uh, lots of missile launchers and, and, and mortars and, and other kind of fires that you could direct at a Chinese um, assault force. So, um, you know, I, when I advise the US government, I, a lot of it is just trying to like, what can we MacGyver together right now to try to shore up deterrence in the Taiwan Strait? Because I, I just worry that time is short. Um, and the second point, which I'll just make very briefly, is that I, I worry that if the war occurs, it could actually go long. Um, and that's because that's been the case for most major power wars. Usually, you know, the great powers, they get into the war thinking it's going to be this short, sharp conflict and they'll be home for Christmas. And then it ends up dragging on for years and years. And both sides escalate both horizontally into new theaters as well as vertically by ramping up the amount of firepower that they bring on each other. And so this again means that if you're the United States or Taiwan, you can't just be thinking about how to repel the initial wave of a Chinese uh, amphibious invasion or, or the initial few weeks of a Chinese blockade of Taiwan, you actually have to be thinking that this conflict could drag on, which means you need the ability to, uh, to, to rearm, to regroup and reload um, and to build up the capacity to churn out war material for, for the long run. And right now the United States and Taiwan really don't have much capability to, um, to do that. Um, the last thing I would say is that the United States and Taiwan need to be thinking about off ramps because I for every article or book I read about how to fight China in a war over Taiwan, I read maybe like half of an article. For, for every thousand articles I read about how to fight a war over Taiwan, I read maybe one article about how to de-escalate a conflict once it starts. Like what would be the kind of peace deals that could be struck? Because presumably the war would not end with either Beijing marching on, on Washington DC or vice versa. It's gonna end with some kind of negotiated settlement. So what would that settlement look like? How could you allow China to save some face you know, and claim some semblance of a victory so that they don't feel they have to fight on and vice versa? Um, these are the kind of things that need to be taken seriously, but unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be the case um, in most strategic debates today. So I'll leave it there since um, I know we have other distinguished speakers and, and I want to get to discussion as well. But thanks so much for tuning in. Thank you so much, Professor Beckley. Very insightful analysis. And uh, next, we have uh, Professor Mario Del Perro, who is a professor of international history at Sciences Po in Paris, uh, where he teaches courses on the United States in the world of the Cold War and uh, 20th and 21st century global history. Um, he has published very widely in both English and Italian. And uh, before joining Sciences Po, Professor Del Perro has taught at the University of Bologna and held professorships and visiting professorships at the European University Institute, um, the, the Klug Center of the Library of Congress, Columbia University, New York University, and the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies of Geneva. He's currently writing a book on a mission of Texan evangelicals in the early post-World War II Italy, uh, which tries to offer a micro-historical account of the global dynamics of integration of the Cold War. Uh, Professor Del Perro also runs a blog and regularly comments on the United States and international politics for the Italian and Swiss public radios and for Sky News. Thank you for joining us, Professor Del Perro. Oh, thanks a lot uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, I was telling Lucas that I've been tested positive uh, to COVID a few days ago, so I'm secluded in my bedroom. Uh, it means also I have a small child, uh, 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 appropriately nicknamed Godzilla, uh, in the other room. So if you hear some screaming, uh, <laughs> no need to call Save the Children. It's just you know, my, <laughs> my daily life at home with a two-year-old. Uh, that said, uh, thanks for the invitation. It's also a great pleasure to be here with uh, uh, Professor Beckley. God knows how many students of mine have read his 2011-2012 article on China's uh, century for international security, which I loved at the time. I, I, I then have, you know, inflicted uh, on on many of my uh, on many of my students. So. Um, I understood actually originally it was more of a back and forth of, of a Q uh, of a Q and A uh, between uh, you and us. But following uh, what, what Michael did, uh, I'll offer a couple of quick, very quick reflections on Ukraine, and then we can move on and try to link uh, the two because the, uh, 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 there is a, clearly a potential linkage uh, between between Ukraine and, and Taiwan, if you between uh, China and Russia. So what have we seen in this, what is uh, a bit more than a month 
uh, two months actually uh, of, of war, and it began the 24th uh, of uh, February. We have seen that's uh, banal to say uh, a clear kind of, you know, uh, uh, um, re-cementing of the Atlantic Alliance. Uh, the war, the blatant uh, aggression uh, uh, of Russia, I don't know how else to put it, has provided uh, a long needed and a long absent, if you will, glue uh, between the US and its European allies, but even more among European countries, uh, because within the EU and within the European bloc of the Atlantic community, there have been, there were, there still are, more on which in a second, uh, uh, huge differences, uh, even in, in the kind of policy, uh, in the kind of connection, in the kind of relationship uh, with uh, Russia. So uh, the war has re-cemented transatlantic unity, and that has been very visible, uh, under, however, a reasserted US leadership. Now, we, the Atlantic community has historically worked via the presence of a clear hegemon. Somehow the Atlantic Alliance has been you know, kept united and federated by the presence of a superior actor, which was the US. I don't think what we are seeing now is very much different. Uh, uh, there has been a lot of discussion on, you know, for example, Germany's decision to, uh, uh, to significantly increase a, its defense spending. Uh, and that, I mean, Germany has not been the only European country to follow that line. That is happening under uh, a renewed Atlantic umbrella. It's not the, you know, uh, Macron's and quasi neo gaullist strategic autonomy of Europe, what we are seeing now. As I said, it's, uh, it's happening under US leadership, if you will, under the US watch, under the, uh, uh, the, uh, the NATO and transatlantic uh, umbrella. Finally, from a more, if you will, ideological, discursive, rhetorical point of view, what we are seeing is kind of in a revalidation of a sort of cold, neo Cold War narrative. As a historian, I'm very skeptical of Cold War analogies. I have also written a couple of articles uh, uh, against the use, uh, misuse, and abuse uh, of the Cold War analogy. But in terms of narratives, somehow what uh, we are seeing today is the uh, alleged apparent revalidation of a sort of you know black and white narrative of a community of democracies led by the US kept together by US leadership as I was saying facing a very authoritarian state uh, uh, which has you know uh, 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 which uh, uh, has been subjected its population to a brutal neo-authoritarian turn post uh, 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 beginning of the war, which is visible on multiple counts, and it's visible also on the kind of a new diaspora of many, you know, uh, uh, even academics. Uh, one of my dearest uh, colleagues is a, a Russian uh, academic who left Russia in 2013 after being, you know, he was the rector of a major Russian university, and he left the country after being harassed by, uh, by the regime. And he was telling me that something similar at a lower and less visible level is happening today and presumably will continue to happen in the near future. So uh, to sum up, uh, the, uh, the, the war has provided the Atlantic Alliance with a sort of rational re-strengthening the unity or somehow silencing the differences within the Atlantic Alliance. The war has somehow reasserted US leadership and the war has revalidated a kind of you know, ideological, very binary partition of the international system or more specifically of what's going on in Europe uh, today. That said, uh, I see 
no reasons to be optimistic at the moment. There are no breaking points visible. It's very hard to imagine an outcome. So following up on what Michael was saying, you know, imagining uh, a Taiwan war scenario, what we are seeing in Ukraine now is a war which is potentially bound to last. Clearly, Ukraine will not set for a, 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 a compromise of sort at the moment. Clearly, Russia will not accept a form of you know, punitive defeat. Clearly, the sanctions, they take time to, 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 to bite in a way. And they also take time to make their effects visible on Russia, but even you know, in those European countries, I think of Germany and Italy, which are more dependent on Russia or more interdependent uh, with Russia. So the absence of a clear breaking point, point uh, uh, leads, to, uh, uh, leads me to believe that the war will go on for a while with all the, you know, the, the consequences uh, of that. And finally, whichever the outcome, and it's hard as of today to imagine an outcome, whichever the outcome, it will leave us with some you know, major issues uh, bound to remain. We will have a Russia which is a pariah of the international system, but it is a pariah which sits on thousands of warheads still endowed with uh, 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 the natural resources on which Russia uh, has relied so much. We will have a Ukraine you know, in which it, the national identity will be radically redefined by this war, by the heroic resistance and by what Ukraine ha is doing. Uh, you know, nations are, I don't want to get too academic here, but nations are constantly reimagined, reinvented. They leave a foundational myths. And in the Ukrainian national mythology, 2022 will, will be almost foundational, so to speak. But this radically nationalist Ukraine will be strongly anti-Russian, inevitably so, understandably so, if not, you know, Russia phobic. It will be a hyper-nationalist country with a strong sense of, you know, victimhood. I don't know how else to put it bound to have a kind of, you know, special track to EU membership, which is problematic on multiple counts, and therefore bound to, you know, have an impact within the larger, you know, European community, European uh, uh, group. And then finally, you will still have divisions among European countries, which are and uh, remain very deep. They have been silenced by the war, I mean, Russia managed, you know, to, Putin has managed to, to, to somehow uh, uh, amass the, the largest quantity of strategic mistakes one can think of in a single shot, right? You have, you know, NATO and Sweden now, uh, Finland and Sweden now considering NATO membership. You have Germany, you know, putting on hold uh, the, the pipeline, uh, Nord Stream 2, and so forth and so on. But that said, those differences remain. Poland and Germany, or Poland and Hungary, they have very different positions vis-a-vis -vis, uh, 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 Russia for a variety of reasons. And those will still be there at the end uh, of the war. I stop here with just one last sentence. Those divisions that kind of you know, European, Europe's pluralism or diversity is also very visible uh, uh, in the relationship and therefore in the attitude European countries have vis-a-vis -vis China. And the elephant in the room, once again, as always, when we talk of Europe today is Germany. I mean, we can, you know, we can discuss of European integration and Macron can play the military card to claim a role 
that France cannot have it. Uh, I mean, you know, my colleagues at Sciences Po don't like to hear that. There is still a very strong kind of neo gaullist you know, belief in, in France's grandeur, but the hegemon in Europe is Germany. Uh, the, the actor that called the shots is Germany. We saw that post 2008. We saw that over uh, Greece. We saw that even in the case of Italy. Uh, and that applies also to Russia and to China. Just to make a, one banal example, and I, and I stop here. If you look at China, Germany has, as of today, a total volume of trade, which is almost the same level of uh, the trade Germany has with the US. Germany doesn't run with China, the same monumental trade surplus it has with the US, China has become a key economic partner of Germany. And if you look at you know, German, Germany's trade balance with China, it is in Europe in a league of its own. I mean, it's just in, in another planet. If compared to you know, the balance of trade and the volumes of trade, imports, exports of Italy, the Netherlands, who ha uh, who, which has a large, large deficit with China, not to mention France. Okay, I'll stop here, but I hope there would be the, the possibility then to, to, to come back to some of, the, of those points. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Del Perro. It's, it's <clears throat> definitely uh, very relevant as the French presidential election is still ongoing into the second round, I believe, and uh, where France will be heading to is, um, and Europe as a whole will be heading to is definitely um, something to look forward to. And um, of course, um, our third participant is um, <clears throat> uh, Ebenezer uh, Azamadi, uh, who is from uh, the Department of Politics and International Relations, DPIR at the University of Oxford. He is a uh, ardent Klaschwitzen with keen interest uh, in the interactions between wars and the origins of world orders. Azamadi is a student in residence at University College Oxford and reads for the DPhil in uh, international relations. His research examines real politic and illiberal great powers conceptions of established international doctrines and liberal concepts. In particular, he is a student of classical realism in training who investigates the complex connections between international commitments and the national interests of great powers involved in the management of the international order via preeminent international institutions. Ebenezer, you have the floor. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this. I must say it's a great honor to be on the same platform with two professors. Uh, one of which uh, I have read, one of whom I've read um, his article before and um, actually used for my own assignments uh, some years ago, uh, again, uh, undergrad, Professor Mike Beckley. It's a pleasure to be on a panel with you and, and um, also a pleasure to be here. Now, a lot has been said. Where do I want to start from? Uh, the, uh, the previous speakers, focused on China, one person focused on China, and the second person focused on Russia and Ukraine, and also concluded with a little bit of China. Now, I look at both nations because, uh, interestingly, they are part of what I call illiberal states, and arguably the most powerful illiberal states in the international system. So I focus on those two countries. Now, in my discussion, um, I intend to make three main points, uh, but I would start with two questions. The first question is, what does the West want? If there is a West, what does it want? And secondly, does the West need Russia and China? These two questions I would answer after my main three points I want to make. Now, when Everybody talks about China and Russia and whether or not uh, there's going to be a great war. Professor Michael Beckley said he, he relatively is hoping that there's not going to be a, a, a great war between China and Russia. And then um, he continues to make the point that, well, even though some people say it seems likely, he is uncomfortable with it. But 
for me, the, the, the point that I want to make is when we are talking about war, is the West interested in wars at the moment? Doesn't seem like that. That's the first point I'd like to make. Now, take Iraq 2003, when the neocons were in power and they were more interested in going to Iraq. Now, public opinion then was different. Access to information then was different. In today's world, information dis dissemination has become so quick and every Tom, Dick and Harry has access to information. At least if you can read and write, you have access to information on whatever is going on in the world. And over the years, what the West has done is that public opinion is the West, is the, in the West is the first to condemn uh, whatever Western leaders decide to do. Thinking about this leads me to the position that a decision by the West to go to war with China should China decide to invade you, uh, in Taiwan would be absolutely controversial and highly contested. Now, more importantly, we've seen how um, the West, Western nations have dilly-dallied when it came to Ukraine and Russia, because obviously, again, the argument of um, we are not interested in the nuclear war, Russia might attack us, we don't want to involve ourselves in a long drawn war with Russia, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these is also fueled by public opinion. Now, these factors have resulted in the West strategically evading realities. And the evasion of realities obviously results in avoidance of war. Imagine the US put itself forward that should Russia invade Ukraine, they would wage a war, is a, a war against the international community. And therefore, the, the, the US, NATO led by the US was going to attack Russia directly. Um, surely Vladimir Putin would have threatened nuclear war, but would we have gotten there? Perhaps not. And that is why the times of Ronald Reagan were interesting. When Reagan decided to increase uh, the, the number of US weaponry, we realized where the Russians got to. But today, the times of Ronald Reagan, the times of the Ronald Reagans and the Nixons and all the others have long passed. And we are in a time where every time they can Harry can comment on foreign affairs and has an opinion about foreign, about international relations and what countries do and what they don't do. This has also led to the limitation of what leaders can do and what they cannot do because they are, af they are afraid of public opinion. Of course, I'm not saying public opinion didn't exist in those days, it existed, but today it seems louder than ever. Now this has led to seeing leaders always coming to be, oh, we are those who actually love international law. We, we love human rights and we know uh, what to do in such times. The love for human rights, love for international law and all of these have left China and Russia thinking that, oh, of course, if we go to war, the West is going to argue with international law. The West is going to argue with human rights. That's all actually because of this and that, because of international law, because of the fact that we love human rights, we are democratic in the laws and et cetera, they are surely not going to come after us. Surely they will use sanctions. And this leads to me to my second point. But even before that, the, the continuous resorting to international, to arguments on international law, human rights, et cetera, means that over the year, China and over the years, China and Russia have been practicing what I have termed as realpolitik internationalism, where basically, where, where international law human rights or any other international liberal doctrines actually plays to their advantage, they use them. And obviously, when they know that the West is going to play the cards of uh, these international liberal doctrines, they take advantage to exploit the more. And obviously, the West is left to continuously uh, resort to, oh, we believe in international. And of course, 
China continue to do that and do whatever they want to do. Points I would like to make is this whole idea, um, the idea of international law and human rights. Again, over the years, the continuous expansion of international law and human rights institutions to cover Russia and China have now made it impossible for the West to be able to directly confront these two countries. Now, if you use international law and you continue to argue in the name of those, what happens is that China and Russia are left out because they don't strictly believe in these things as the West believe in them. They think it's actually means an end and they continue to exploit these means to an end. And this is where it becomes critical. The continuous use of have now become normalized by the West. And we should think that countries Uh, I think, I think I have an answer. Oh, it's back. Hi, can you hear so us? Can you, yes, I can hear you. Is it university college Wi-Fi? <laughs> I suppose so. Unsurprising, unsurprising, <laughs> sorry. Did I, get, did I get cut off a bit? Yeah, I think, I think you cut out in the middle. Oh, sorry. So why, why um, do you remember why I got cut off? Um, and the continued use of sanctions and the effects that would have on the United States and the West being able to confront uh, China and Russia, if I remember correctly. Right. Right. So um, what the point I was making, uh, that was my third point, is the continuous usage of sanctions against Russia and China equally means that these countries are also learning. And of course, once you learn you also come to achieve something with what you have learned. There is a, fam there is a, a very famous African proverb that goes like, if, they, if hunters learn to shoot without missing, birds would also learn to fly without patching. What that means is that if you, continues to, if you continue to sanction us, we'd find ways around these sanctions. And over the years, China, Russia, have been finding ways uh, sorry um we can hear you yeah right so when, when these days, when people say um, sanctions against Russia are going to bite Russia hard, etc., cetera, I ask myself, so do people think Russia is not learning anything from these sanctions? Do people think Russia is just sitting down without strategizing and planning? Surely Russia and China, are, Russia is sitting down and planning and strategizing. Of course, um, once we are we are in the West, we will be thinking that, oh yeah, our actions are biting them so hard, etc., cetera, et cetera. But then it's good to look at the other end. What is Russia doing? What will Russia do after this war? However long it takes, what would Russia do to become very useful and relevant again to the West? Because that will lead me to my next point. But even before that, um, I would want to cite an example. In 2014, when Russia was, well, sorry, in 2012, when you, uh, Iran was uh, switched out of the, the SWIFT system, we realized that just eight months afterwards, China decided to start thinking about an alternative to the SWIFT system. And now we have the SIP. So imagine one day uh, the West decides to completely cut out, cut off Russia from the SWIFT system. What happens? Surely Russia would find out an alternative. And in fact, they even started that in 2014 when 
uh, there were threats that they were going to be sanctioned. And in fact, they were, they were sanctioned. They are central, their banks were sanctioned in 2014. They developed an alternative internally where they could still transfer money and do transactions, monetary transactions in Russia. Obviously, once you are doing this, what is happening is that the effect of the West is reducing gradually. Of course, some people may say is um, in terms of firepower, in terms of military energy and all of that, the, the West still has advantages. But these things, we do not realize their effects immediately. They grow gradually. The next most important point, which answers uh, one of my questions, is does the West need Russia and China? Uh, surely, it needs one of them, but it doesn't need both. Unfortunately, the strategic thinking that used to exist in the, in the State Department and the Foreign Office in Britain and the United, in the United States seemed to have lost uh, effect. In the 70s, when um, the communists were trying, to, were trying to gang up against the, the, the West, Henry Kissinger was smart and swift, and he was able to he was able to court the Chinese to his to the side of the West, and they came against the the the, the, the Soviets. <laughs> Obviously, that is not the only thing that is not the only thing that reduced the effect of communism around the world and the effect of 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 of, of the Soviets around the world. But of course, it was very very effective and useful. But today both Russia and China have unfortunately been demonized. And for me, my argument has always been, maybe it would be better if we had a reconsideration of the Kissingerian approach in the 60s and 70s, where at the end of the day, there was an effective way of reducing the effect of, of, of the Soviets around the world. The final point which I would make is what is, is in answering my question, what does the West want? At this point in time, the West doesn't seem to know what exactly it wants. Does the West want a divided world or the West want a world that is infused together? We have a one, one world that includes China and Russia, or we want a world where Russia and China are on their own with their allies and the West is also on its own with its allies. This question has been the major question on the minds of uh, policymakers since the end of the Cold War. And of course, unipolarity has made it impossible for the West to understand that there will always be, uh, quote unquote, enemies, people who don't really approve of the West. At any point in time, every point in time, the world cannot think equally. We cannot all have the same um, ideas or the same style of thinking. Somebody would oppose some group of countries would oppose what the West thinks. But sadly, this has not been a reality that the West has accepted since the end of the Cold War. And also, the West has equally not accepted that they want to have a, 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 a united world. That makes it difficult to know where exactly the West stands. In fact, to even, even within the West, among the West, one, one major problem is of course, people talk about Germany all the time. And I asked myself, what does the West want Germany to be? Uh, they want Germany to be a strong military power or a weakened military power. Obviously, within the West, opinions are divided. France and Britain will surely not want to have a, 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 a strong, a militarily strong Germany. But to some extent, the United States would have wished that there was a strong, a, a militarily strong Germany we have to acknowledge the reality that the United States alone cannot supervise peace over the world at this point, as it used to do uh, immediately and after the Cold War. So now the West has to make a choice as to whether there has to be other strong powers in addition to Britain, France, and the United States, or they want to keep things as they are now. And of course, once things are kept as they are now, China and Russia surely know that there's the West would just be backing without biting. So I'll end here. Okay, those are very interesting points. Um, so I think what we're gonna do right now is pivot towards a little bit and try to dissect every 
a lot of the points that have been made and try to re re relating them back towards Sino-US relations. Um, I think on the point that Dr. Del Perro and Ebenezer are made about Germany, I think we should start there with regard to the Ukraine situation and its relationship with China. Um, obviously, we have seen a titanic, a titanic shift between German policy before the war and after, Germany rearming, Germany being a little bit more assertive in its affairs with regard to Europe. Um, Dr. Del Perro, you mentioned that NATO has historically always acted as guided by a hegemon. Can Germany kind of fill that place while the United States increasingly pivots towards the Indo-Pacific? Or do you not, do you believe that's not realistically or feasible at this moment? I think that would be an important question to answer. Oh, thanks. Oh, in a nutshell, I, the answer is no. Uh, uh, it, it is no because Germany still lacks the resources uh, uh, to do so and possibly the political will. It is true that Germany has been more assertive, has reconsidered some elements of his Russian policies, uh, uh, even post-2014-2015. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Germany is the actor somehow today uh, resisting uh, 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 a modification of the policy on sanctions and the extension of sanctions also to, to those key realms, name energy uh, resources, the Russian energy resources, which uh, Germany and Italy, those are the two countries uh, most exposed, uh, uh, most dependent uh, on those resources, which uh, Germany and Italy and their economies uh, still need. The second point, uh, uh, I don't know what Michael thinks uh, about it, is that it's somehow artificial to separate neatly the Atlantic, Euro-American, so to speak, uh, uh, situation and alliance from the Asia Pacific. Uh, the two are tightly interconnected given how integrated China is in the global economy and therefore uh, how uh, um, important the position of China still is in the global supply chains, uh, for example, often in the beginning or intermediate stages, and the power of conditionality, so to speak, that this uh, uh, Chinese presence in the globally integrated economy uh, 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 confers uh, to China. Put it very simply, uh, I don't think you can imagine a situation in which the US you know, pivots to Asia and delegates responsibilities to the Europeans in Europe. A, because the Europeans are too fragmented and divided and without the American federator, so to speak, those divisions are bound to explode. Uh, uh, no one really wants the Macron model of, you know, of a Europe led by France in the military and strategic realm. And B, because if you want to contain somehow China or weaken China, you need Europe's, Europe on board, uh, uh, given that you know, Chinese investments in Europe, China's trade with Europe, and China's ability, therefore, to rely on that to eventually make up for uh, a loosening of the Sino-US uh, interdependence. An example I often make with my students is the new NAFTA, the new, uh, it's called now USMCA uh, agreement, you know, uh, approved with a large bipartisan support in the US. And there are many clauses, many elements in the new, in the NAFTA too, if we want to call it so, which have a clear anti-Chinese, you know, objective. Uh, rational to get to the tariff zero automobiles cars produced in the nafta space space they have to have a percentage of the components that make those cars that now have to reach 75 percent it was 62.5 before what does it mean that the ford factory in queretaro uh, mexico needs to assemble those cars with components 
which are themselves in large part produced within the North American space and not imported from elsewhere, which means first and foremost from China. That's the kind of logic that has informed the US attitude vis-a-vis -vis China in the past few years, both Biden and, and Trump. And Europe is still very reluctant to follow the US on that path, but the kind of containment of China that the US uh, uh, envisioned today, I think, follows that route and therefore requires a full US, uh, European presence. It requires the cooperation of Europe, and which is a cooperation that's very problematic to come. Long story short, I don't think Europe has the resources, but also the political will to somehow you know, stand on its own and allow the US to transfer resources and commitments to uh, the Asia Pacific. But also, I don't think you can neatly separate the two. Somehow, the US needs Europe also in the Asia Pacific, so to speak. Um, one quick follow up, and then we can pivot to Professor Beckley. Um, we saw that China you know, and Russia. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to hear what Professor Beckley thinks about this, but uh, this particular point. Um, we saw that China and Russia made a joint statement right before the Olympics, and China has been a little bit, it has made not tacit support, but indirect, given Russia indirect support during the whole creating crisis. And we have seen that European governments are a little bit more hesitant than they were before about Chinese actions. Do you think that China's actions vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine could change European perceptions in the long run? And then we can, I'd like to hear what Professor Beckley thinks about this. Um, possibly. Uh, there are some elements. You think of the you know, Chinese direct investments in Europe. Uh, there are some elements on which some European countries have taken in the past few years some more, you know, a more severe, a more strict kind of approach and attitude. Uh, when it comes to Chinese investments post-2017, there has, has been, even in Germany, a more uh, 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 strict betting uh, and there has been a decline in, in Chinese FDIs in Europe which is not that different from the dynamic we have seen uh, uh, in the US. Uh, clearly, Ukraine is a big test of China's ability to act responsibly. Uh, uh, now, uh, Michael earlier on was saying China is a kind of a window, I'm not calling it of opportunity, of risk. There is a window of risk, the 2020s, because usually China can become more aggressive when it, it is slightly declining uh, more than when it is rising. At the same time, China has multiple interests in global stability in the status quo, right? Uh, so there is a tension uh, uh, there, I think. I'm not entirely convinced that China and Russia can move beyond the kind of opportunistic convergence as the one we have seen today in the past few months, even because generating, producing that kind of integration that China has seen as experience in the global order post 1970s requires also the development of infrastructures the full integration within a specific still, you know, liberal or US mostly ruled or dominated international order. And it's very difficult to imagine something similar taking place happening between Russia and China in the short term. Very banally, you have to, to, to create a kind of, you know, deep economic integration between the two countries, a real form of interdependence. You need, you know, to heavy infrastructural investments. You know, as of today, it takes a week for a train to go from Moscow to, to Vladivostok, just to give you one example among many. So there is a huge landmass in between and linking the two countries, building pipelines, railroads, and so forth and so on, does take a lot of time and makes this kind of you know, alternative block, if you want to call it so, hard to imagine at least on the short term. All right. 
And Professor Beckley, I'd like to hear your perspective on this. I think you've written a little bit about this in foreign affairs, so it, I think it's sure. an important voice. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I agree with um, Professor Del Perro on, on many points, um, in particular, this idea that, uh, you know, the United States can't sort of outsource European security to the Europeans and concentrate on Asia. And the United States also needs a lot of European participation in order to implement its more a more comprehensive strategy vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, I think, you know, in my sense is that um, sometimes people assume that you need this like block of countries all moving in lockstep and completely unified and doing the exact same thing. And so if the United States can't get Germany to, to ramp up its naval presence in the South China Sea, that that's somehow a failure of the alliance. What I, what I see is more of like a web of lots of little ad hoc coalitions springing up that are tailored around specific issues that when you add it all up, forms a pretty could form a pretty powerful containment barrier against China if it comes to fruition. So, um, you know, while I, I don't think the United States expects European powers to get directly involved in, in any kind of military fighting if there's a war over Taiwan, they do, they are working with European powers to develop, you know, new trade and investment standards that uh, sort of implicitly discriminate against China. I think a lot of what the G7 was doing even before the Ukraine crisis was setting up these new standards and then ad hoc uh, technology coalitions to cut China off from key technologies was already um, sort of a, a warning, a shot across the bow for, for Beijing. So I think it's more of that sort of thing. And then focusing on with the countries in the region in East Asia to actually hold the line militarily. Um, the only other scenario would be if there's some kind of protracted conflict and the United States was looking for ways to escalate the conflict horizontally through some sort of blockade of China's energy supplies through the Strait of Malacca, then European navies suddenly become extremely important for that as well. But I don't think the United States expects, nor should it, you know, any kind of European participation and sort of like, a it's not, it's not like the, the front in the Cold War, you know, plugging Central Europe and, and plugging the Fulda gap with a, a unified NATO. I don't think the United States needs that or is asking European powers to do that. Um, so yeah, it's, to me, I, it just seems like there's this web of various types of anti-China action coalescing. Um, whether it comes to fruition, there's still a lot of divisions internally, but I think ironically, the Ukraine crisis has accelerated it just because it seems like it's woken up countries around the West to number one, that war is a real possibility. Like it's not some sort of abstract thing. You know, Russia's kind of shaken us out of our, uh, our stupor with that. And second, uh, just that uh, these authoritarian powers need to be taken literally and seriously. You know, like when, when Putin was talking about how Ukraine doesn't actually exist as a nation, it turns out like that, that's really what he believes and he's going to act on that and send massive military forces to make that happen. And so now I think people are looking at Xi Jinping's statements on Taiwan and the South China Sea and maybe taking them more seriously and literally than they did before. Again, maybe these things won't come to fruition, but I see momentum gathering and gathering pace and, and the Ukraine crisis has even been stepping on the on the accelerator even to a greater degree. And to me, you know, some people think that China has been having a good war with Ukraine because somehow this serves Chinese interests to have Russia uh, launch this war right after China announces a no limits partnership. But to me, it seems like a disaster for China on numerous fronts, because for one thing, Russia, I mean, Russian power, economic and military power is going to be crippled by this crisis, no matter what the Russian military is getting ground down by the Ukrainians at the same time that the Russian economy is being choked out through Western sanctions. So Russia is just less, a less it brings less to the table simply because its power is being constrained so much by the crisis. And at the same time, uh, it's it's galvanized, you know, capitals around the West to try to look at this situation more carefully. So to me, this just seems like a horrible outcome. And then on top of that, you know, China is a major commodities importer. And when you take Russia, a major oil producer and major supplier to China, partially off the market, and when you jeopardize also the food production of both Ukraine and Russia, that can cause prices to rise. And that puts China in even further of a bind because China is having to scramble for places to find just basic necessities like food and energy. And so if this crisis continues, I think it's going to be even worse for China just from a sort of macroeconomic perspective as well. And just a quick follow up, you have, um, you've made your point very clear that you think China is peaking and that there's a closing window of opportunity with regard to uh, Taiwan. 
um, given how hard of a how difficult it has been for Russia to defeat an enemy that's right on its doorstep, has that thinking if if China was opting for the military option in the later later in the decade, do you think this conflict has changed that point of view, or do you think it the uh, the use of force persists within Xi Jinping's inner circle? Yeah, so I'm I'm of two minds of this. On the one hand, I think if you're like an objective Chinese analyst, you have to look at this and really question even more than you did before the PLA's ability to mount either an amphibious invasion or sustain a blockade against Taiwan. And we've seen this throughout history. You know, authoritarian militaries, sometimes they suffer from the fact that they're so centrally controlled. And so the lower level units are always looking to the capital for orders. And so they're very rigid on the battlefield uh, because promotions tend to be based more on loyalty and politics rather than on competence. You tend to have a lot of corruption in these militaries. And I, I think there's strong reason to believe that PLA suffers from a lot of the same sort of software bugs and weaknesses that the Russian military does. So if you're an objective PLA analyst, I think you have to worry even more that your military may not may look very impressive on paper, but given the lack of combat experience, the, the amount of corruption and just the authoritarian nature of it and the really politicized nature. I mean, each major military unit in China's military has split command. They have the battlefield commander and then they have the political commissar to enforce ideological discipline. And that as a military person, you would never want that to have two different cooks, you know, leading the kitchen in a military conflict. It could lead to disaster. But the problem, I think, is that Xi Jinping may not be getting this message because and I think we saw this on the Russia case, too, where if you're an authoritarian leader and you purged so many of your political rivals and have been ruling with an iron fist through fear, your subordinates are not going to be giving you objective information because you've shot so many messengers along the way and nobody has purged more um, comrades than Xi Jinping. You know, more than a million senior level uh, CCP officials have been pushed out of the party, disappeared, jailed or, or basically been demoted over the last uh, five or six years. And so my, my worry is that even though there's an objective case to make that the PLA should maybe tread more lightly, just given the fact that you know, in, in the fog of war, things could go very badly for them, even if they have immaculate battle plans on paper. But the problem is, uh, I worry that Xi Jinping is surrounded by a bunch of yes people, essentially, that they, will, they won't tell him and be totally straight with him um, because he's, he's, he clearly wants to have some kind of reaction under his, his regime, under his time in office, um, has made that clear. And they, they are worried about, you know, giving him information that may disrupt that because they don't want their head on the chopping block. So that's, that's my biggest worry. Okay. And on that point of information, I think we can pivot to something that Ebenezer said in his opening statement with regard to the, the West's willingness to go to war, essentially, or to up the ante in a crisis like this. Um, Ebenezer, you mentioned the, nation, the nature of information and how technology has made information so accessible around the world and noted that that could potentially hamper the West's ability to respond in the event of a crisis. Um, in the past, we have also seen democracies kind of be a little bit ambivalent or a little bit uh, contemptuous with regard to the international system uh, right before uh, an attack. And then once the attack happens, whether it is the attack on Poland or right now in Ukraine, democracies move into action relatively quickly. Do you think the information sphere has changed that, technology has changed that, or if an attack on Taiwan, for example, were to happen, or if the Ukraine war escalates, do you think that the technology of today has made that rule, uh, that past precedent irrelevant? So um, we, I will start by pointing out that we have to show that uh, there's been times that um, democracies have been ambivalent or contentious towards the international system. Um, in those times, the sort of information that was available to the public, the amount of information that was available to the public, is not the same as today, the, the, the amount of information we have um, as um, the general public. And to be fair, if the, Ukraine, if the Ukraine war were to escalate or China were to attack Taiwan, obviously we are still going to get these loud voices and loud, um, uh, so-called pacifists who would be predominant on all forms of social media, screaming and shouting and, and, and mainstream media uh, debating why it is not useful for the West to get involved. 
And these days, emotions have become more useful in the West than realities. Um, people have, well, to put it, well, quite harshly, failed to accept realities these days. People are actually more interested in how much we can emote and not how much we can face the realities. And for me, China is looking carefully at what is going on in Ukraine and noting down the fact that day in, day out, there are people from the West who are continuously arguing that it's not useful for the West to get involved in this war. And of course, this even includes academics uh, and, and so-called experts on international relations who argue strongly that it's not useful for the West to be involved in this war. Do I have a position on this war? Perhaps not. But to me, even if people such as I have mentioned do not have interest in the West getting involved in this war, I do not think it is useful for it to be unveiled so public as they have done. Because look, as, as, as um, Stalin said some years ago, I have, quote, I have very useful idiots in the West, unquote. That was Stalin, because in those days, Stalin could see clearly how much people were even advocating for his Soviet Union in the time, in the West, right? Now, if you have Xi Jinping, who has planted all sorts of spies all over in the West, in the Western universities, in the Western media, even in Western political parties, etc., uh, and they are all listening and seeing all these sort of information and feeding them back to China. Clearly, uh, they are watching and knowing that. Well, I mean, if we should invade Taiwan, the argument would be: Well, Taiwan has always been part of um, Taiwan has always been part of of um, of China, and it was only in 1949 that they left. So surely we are going to get people in the West who would argue this. And the other time I saw in a paper, one particular paper in Britain, very, very famous paper, where someone was arguing that, well, um, Russia's claim uh, over, over Crimea is not uh, right any more than the Brit any more than, it's not wrong any more than Britain's claim over, over the Falklands. So if you have like people in the West, writing these things, spreading these kind of information clearly, and um, these countries would obviously be assured of their support in the West. And once these supports are expressed loudly in the West, it's going to make it difficult for Western leaders to make any strong decisions to go to war or make any stronger decisions, any decisions that are stronger than just imposing sanctions. And as I told early on, Russia and China are beginning to know how to go around these sanctions. And so you made a point that, oh yeah, when the Ukrainian war, when the war against Ukraine started, the West came to uh, a decision very quickly. Even that is even debatable because we all saw the division among the Western nations when some sanctions were, were proposed and how long it took some of these countries to even agree to the proposition of an, an implementation of these sanctions. So, and more importantly, Yes, they, they made a decision to, to, to go with sanctions, but are sanctions stronger enough? In those days, I'm sure democratic, these democratic nations would have gone beyond just sanctions and do, and do things more, more decisively uh, rather than just imposing sanctions that even up to today, some countries do not fully agree with, but just have to go with just because of public opinion. Okay. That's very interesting. Um, so now that we're approaching the end, I think we could probably wrap up with a few closing statements on what the impact Ukraine is having on the more widely on not just the transatlantic alliance, but perhaps on the global order. How will American foreign policy change as a result? National security strategy was released right before the invasion and mainly focused on China, but we now, or the Asia uh, Indo Pacific strategy, sorry. And now we're seeing that perhaps the national security strategy might change. With, especially in the United States. So how do you guys think this particular situation in Ukraine will impact the long-term trends of this decade and further on? Um, so if we can start with Professor Del Perro, move on to Professor Beckley and finish off with well, Ebenezer. I, Thank okay, you. Thanks. Uh, well, I, I partially answered, uh, I think in my first intervention, uh, surely the 
on the short term, uh, it, it's reversing the trend on defense spending. Post 2008, one could say post 1991, in the case of many, many European countries, there has been a constant decline in, in, in military spending. Uh, Ukraine is very banally the return of war, and of a very orthodox, conventional, traditional, brutal uh, war. And what we have seen uh, for the moment uh, is that the first almost instinctive reaction is to commit to spend uh, more uh, on defense. The second point, I think it's, it goes back to what Professor Beckley was saying. We need to take, I don't want to call it ideology, but you know, the rhetoric, the language, the lexicon that comes out of those countries seriously. As a matter of fact, both in France and Italy, there is a long tradition of Ukrainian studies. And those experts have been saying that for quite some time. Pay attention to what Putin or you know, the main ideologues uh, of the Russian regime are saying about Ukraine and pay attention to that. Uh, and I think uh, 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 that what has, has happened, I imagine all of you remember Putin's last speech before the beginning of the war, which was you know, this kind of his historical kind of you know, uh, a fresco on, on, on one century of, or, or more of history, beginning with you know, accusing Lenin and moving on all the way to Gorbachev, uh, passing uh, by uh, Stalin and uh, Khrushchev in between. It gives us also a sense of the centrality of history, of a certain view, of a certain you know, historical uh, uh, imagination. The last point, which we haven't mentioned here, is that there is a big, you know, a big variable, a big unknown, which is the, you know, the domestic, political, and electoral dynamics of the U.S. and of the European democracies. Uh, we live in, you know, hyper-polarized and very volatile political systems. Uh, we have seen pre-COVID, COVID helped the European Union and a certain European cosmopolitanism, if you will. But pre-COVID, we have seen countries, think of the Italian government for a while, which were explicitly pro-Russian on the one side and very open to set up a kind of special relationship with China. Uh, here in Paris, we will have in a week uh, a runoff with one of the two candidates who was extremely close to a link to Putin uh, and Russia. And the two Putinian candidates in the first round together got more than 30% of the votes. You have the US going through a political constitutional crisis, which is not over at all. It is kind of, you know, in our attention, it's left on hold because we're all, you know, focused on Ukraine and China and other things, you know, state uh, uh, Congresses are approving laws which will be then tested in 2024, potentially with you know, unimaginable conse constitutional consequences. And I can go on and on and on. Uh, so long story short, uh, I think that's a key variable uh, and a key unknown, which could, of course, affect the response. I don't like it to call it the West anymore for a variety of reasons, but in the case of the Atlantic Alliance, it could have a major impact on the foreign policy of the US and its allies, and therefore in the ability to preserve, strengthen, and make more coherent this renewed uh, transatlantic unity uh, drove and provoked by the Ukrainian war. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with pretty much everything Professor Del Perro said, so I'll just kind of foot stomp um, what he pointed out, I think. In the short term, this certainly galvanizes the West, uh, what we call the West, even though it includes many major Eastern countries. But in the long run, you have this counterbalance in the form of populism, which I think is very much alive and well. Obviously, the French election is going to tell us is be sort of a bellwether of that. I think there's a non-trivial risk that Donald Trump is going to be president of the United States. Again, the Democrats don't really seem to have their act together. Now, if, if that occurs, that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have a complete breakdown of at least a coalition that's forming against China because Trump and, and other populists have been 
anti China. There's a big, uh, even in the Republican Party in the United States, there's a big anti China um, basis there. But at the same time, it may, they're not so hot on allies. And so you may have the United States pursuing it in a more unilateral fashion, as we saw during the actual, the initial Trump administration. And that would be especially the case if various European governments end up uh, electing right-wing candidates who want to stake out their own position and who admire someone like Putin, who has aligned himself with the Orthodox Church and is basically reasserting the supremacy of white Christian dominance over other peoples. Um, that's very appealing to certain conservative strains, both within the United States um, and throughout Europe. So I think those are the two main things. I mean, I'm cautiously optimistic that there will be some semblance of at least geopolitical solidarity just given the nature of the russian and chinese threats and the vivid example that we have in the war in ukraine but i mean you know nothing is a foregone conclusion and populism is certainly alive and well and bubbling under the surface um to conclude i would just say uh, three things the first one would be it's about time the U.S. acknowledged that the strategy challenge is on and how do we deal with it uh, sooner than later. For me, if I had the advantage or the opportunity to advise the U.S. government, I'd say maybe it's better to look among China, look between China and Russia which one threatens us in the long term and which one threatens us in the short term which one deals would do a big blow to us uh, if we have to actually face them down directly and which one doesn't and surely the one that doesn't we should be finding ways of trying to bring them into our umbrella so that we can have uh, at least one enemy to fight. And for me, it seems to me that Russia poses a lesser threat than China. So it might be worth US authorities reconsidering their decisions and their positions on Russia uh, in the past years. The other thing I would like to mention um, is about, again, the West being decisive, as in what we want and what we don't want. And what we want Germany, a very important part, what we want Germany to be, or do we want Japan, another important part, what do we want them to be? Do we still want them to be, to, to, to be their kind of post second world war selves? or we want them to be more powerful than what we've made them since 1945. That's very useful. And once these two countries are made stronger beyond what they are today, I think China and Russia would have reason to reconsider their, their, their current positions. The third thing, and finally, for me is, again, this whole proclamation of Yes, we are the ones who believe in the greatest things that have ever happened to the world. We are the ones who are holier than thou, and we know what is best for the world. Some of these decisions have affected the West very badly. Um, I wouldn't want to be the one mentioning some, some, some of these decisions, but obviously we all know how much the decision about climate change and diversification, etc have affected the, the, the West badly. And maybe it's about time to reconsider some of these decisions and see a, a better way forward to ensure that uh, in the short, medium, and long term, the world doesn't become Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I don't think we could hear your last few statements or would you like to repeat that or?
Yeah, my last few statements with um, maybe it's about time the West uh, reconsidered some of its decisions about you know some some of these uh, policies that have in the long term affected affected the West badly. To me, I think um, a reconsideration of of such positions would ensure that in the short term, the long term, and the medium term, the West would be able to overcome the 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 potential challenges that um, past decisions have 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 brought upon the West. Okay, uh, thank you all for your opinion and for your time. Uh, this has been a very interesting uh, conversation on the future of you know, Europe, the United States and China. So we're very thankful at Surge um, to be for you to agree to participate. And we hope to hear your opinions again, maybe in some art future articles or books that are coming out. So thank you. Thank you Thanks so much. Thank for you. Thank you. Good, thank you. Good luck with your studies. Uh, thank you so thank much. You. In your exams. Um, okay. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank Bye. you all so thank much. You. Bye bye. All the best with everything. Bye. Bye.